Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be here today. Good to be here. We're going to go back to the book of Zechariah this morning and continue to study from Zechariah. And uh, somebody remember what Zechariah means? I told you last Sunday morning. That's right. Jehovah remembers. Zechariah. Hananiah. Jehovah. The words that ending in ah in the Old Testament. Yah. Methuselah. When he is dead, what's that name mean? Mm -hmm. When he is dead, Jehovah comes. Um, these names that end in ah in the Old Testament are the uh, the uh, contraction of the name Jehovah. The names that end in L are the, the names that uh, are a contraction of Elohim. Elohim is God. Jehovah is his name. And there's a difference. All right. Now, in Zechariah last week, we uh, we started in chapter number one and told you a little about, we gave you a little bit of a, uh, a uh, chronological setting for this book. The book of Zechariah is winding up Old Testament history. And the reason for this is because the book of Zechariah is written while Israel is in bondage, in uh, captivity. They are in 70 years of captivity that has been prophesied in the book of Jeremiah. And they are in 70 years of captivity, and they're about to be turned loose to come back into the land. And uh, the book of Daniel, ending in Elohim, and Zechariah are two books that are written during this period of captivity. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament as we have it in our canon of Scripture. And, of course, we know that from Malachi unto Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, uh, spans a period of 400 years. We call them, uh, we common them, commonly call them the 400 silent years. The reason we call them the 400 silent years is because we have no canonical scripture written during that period of time. And, of course, you understand, I've said so many times before, canonical simply means of the canon, Canon is, uh, we get the word canon from a cannon. A cannon is straight, like a gun barrel. Uh, imagine trying to shoot a gun that had a twisted barrel. And same with a cannon. Cannon has a straight barrel. And so therefore, when we talk about the canon of Scripture, we're talking about something that is straight, right down the line. It's not deceptive. It is the truth of God and is the Word of God. So canonical Scripture ceased with Malachi and began 400 years later with Matthew, but we do have what's called the Jewish Apocrypha that was written during this 400 years. Two of the books, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, we appeal to for history. And the reliability of these two books uh, is in question, I'm sure of that, and it's not Scripture. But tonight I'll be dealing with 1st and 2nd Maccabees as we talk about Hanukkah and the Feast of Lights and how that relates to the New Testament and the children of Israel. That'll be in the lesson this evening as we meet at 5 o'clock, so don't forget that. We'll be meeting this evening for the New, Year, New Year's Eve service at 5 o'clock. But Scripture ended with Malachi. And uh, Malachi in the Old Testament, if you'd like to turn there, you'll see, as I'm sure it's been pointed out to you before many times, if you'll notice how the Old Testament ends. Malachi chapter number 4, verse 6. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a... And here's the last word in the Old Testament. What is it? A curse. And so who could come and lift that curse? He had to become a curse for us. Galatians chapter 3, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. And the Son of the living God hung on the tree, took our curse. So fulfilling all of the demands and curses of the Old Testament. The Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled all of that. So the Old Testament ends with a curse. And uh, rightly so. Because there is nothing in the Old Testament that can save the soul apart from the Son of God himself. From Genesis through Revelation, he is the only Savior of mankind. No one was ever saved keeping the law in the Old Testament. The law could only curse. Cursed is everyone who doeth not all things contained in the law. You either live by the law or you die 
but you cannot be saved by it. You're saved by faith. So, the book of Zechariah is written while Israel is in bondage or in captivity. It's important because the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the author of this Bible, wants his people to know that even though they are in captivity, God has not forsaken them. They have fallen prey to a Gentile power. Now, we learn about these Gentile powers in the book of Daniel. Turn there with me, please. Chapter number 3. There's a conflict between the Gentile powers and the monarchy in Israel. Daniel chapter number 3. Anybody remember what Daniel means? Dan in Hebrew. Dan in Hebrew means judge. Daniel means God will judge. It means Elohim will judge. Daniel chapter number 3 and verse number 1. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. And Babylon is always forever the enemy of the truth. And it is the enemy of God, and it is the enemy of Christ. And it is the source of perversion and idolatry. So anytime Babylon shows up in your Bible, make note of it, that you're dealing with, a, with an enemy. Not just a neutral entity, but an enemy. And in Daniel chapter number 3 and verse 1, we have an image. Nebuchadnezzar the king, he's the king of Babylon, made an image of gold. The height of this image is set forth for you in verse number 1. The dimensions in chapter number 3 of Daniel work out to 666. The number 666 is stamped on this Gentile image because it's created by a Gentile king. It's created while Israel is in Babylonian captivity. It is created to uh, cause the children of Israel to fall down before it and worship. And, of course, they refuse to do so. The reason they refuse to do so is because they are true believers in Jehovah and they absolutely refuse to have any part in idolatry and that to me is what makes them heroes. There were three of them, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah who were thrown into a fiery furnace because they refused in Daniel chapter number 3 to fall down before this image. Now who are these three, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? That's the pagan name. And 99 times out of 100, the Christians only know the pagan name. And that's a shame. They ought to know their name in Hebrew because the pagans are the ones that named them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Just like they took Daniel and named him Belteshazzar. They changed his name. They didn't like the business that Elohim judges. They didn't like that God judges. They changed that, and they changed it to their God, Belteshazzar. So uh, Daniel is the judge, and notice, Daniel is the judge, Elohim is the judge, and he's using, and using the name Daniel is the judge here in the book of Daniel, while they're in captivity, now, that's no coincidence, even though Israel is vulnerable, Israel has been carried off into Babylon, Jehovah hasn't forsaken them, and he's telling them that even though they're in captivity, Elohim is still the judge, see, even though they're there in the hands of the Babylonians, Elohim, Daniel, Dan will judge. Elohim judges through Dan. He's the judge of his people and he's the judge of the Babylonians. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a vision. He has a vision of an image. And he can't, uh, he can't find an answer from his wise men of this image. But the image has a head of gold. It has a chest of silver, a, a midsection of brass, and legs of iron descending to the point to where in the feet the iron is mixed with clay. This image, which was given, uh, prophesied of the Gentile dominions on this earth, the fact that Gentiles would take authority away from Israel and that they would reign on this earth. That began in 606 B.C. This ran its course up to the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled. And the times of the Gentiles right now are, is in its last gasp, its dying throes, about to finish. The prophecy given in the book of Daniel says that Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Jesus Christ quotes this, makes it very clear to the people that the Gentile dominions are going to rule this earth until their time is finished. So the book of Daniel along with the book of Zechariah, makes a very powerful statement in the Old Testament to God's providential care of his people 
even though it appears that he's forsaken them because he's let them be he's let them be carried off into Babylonian captivity he didn't forsake them he chastened them 70 years of captivity in Babylon folks was a chastening he used an evil empire a godless nation to chasten his people now that's a remarkable thing when you think about it but that's exactly what he did he used this to chasten the children of Israel after 70 years they were able to come back from Babylonian bondage but the book of Daniel along with the book of Zechariah reveal, reveals a character that we need to be concerned with it reveals one who is the enemy of God the enemy of man and he has his power and authority from the devil now who would that be the Antichrist look over here in the book of Daniel chapter number seven Daniel chapter number 7, and you'll find the second coming of the Lord in verse number 9. You'll find the judgment of God, verse number 9, verse number 10. It says that I beheld till the thrones were cast down, the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fire stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. And then I, I, he said I, in verse number 11, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body was destroyed, and given to the burning flame. Do you know who this beast is in Daniel chapter number 7? The little horn of Daniel 7? He's the man of sin. Notice, here's a judgment where the Lord Jesus Christ, because this is the Ancient of Days, this is who John saw in Revelation chapter number 2. The white hair, the eyes a flame of fire, feet as fine brass, whole countenance shining as the noonday sun. He's coming to judge the Antichrist personally. Why? Because the Antichrist is the direct opposite of Christ. See? The Antichrist is the devil's substitute for the Savior. The Antichrist is the one that this world's church, the ecumenical church, is headed directly for. They think it's Christ. It's not. It's a false Christ. The Antichrist is a liar and a deceiver. He comes on as Christ, but he's not Christ. The New Testament tells us that these Jews were looking for the consolation of Israel and they were waiting for the Lord's Christ. The Lord's Christ is set in contradistinction to the devil's Christ. The devil is an anointed with his own Christ. God the Father has his Christ. Just because someone says Christ or Jesus doesn't mean that they know anything about the one you worship. Paul said in Galatians chapter number 1 that there's another Jesus. He said, if I preach him or an angel or anyone, let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. So in Daniel chapter number 7, we have the Antichrist. What does anti mean? It means against. It means against in the sense that the Antichrist is against Christ. He's the enemy of Christ. But he's also against Christ in the sense that he's set over in contradistinction to Christ. Here's Christ, here's the Antichrist. Here's the true Christ, here's the lie and deceiver. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter number 24, many false Christ shall appear and deceive many. Now why don't men preach that today? Why don't they tell people that there are false Christ and they are out there to deceive people and lead them astray? In Daniel chapter number 7, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he is going to judge the Antichrist personally. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Look at the New Testament counterpart of what you just read in the book of Daniel chapter number 7. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, verse number 7. 2 Thessalonians, rather, chapter 1, verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1 and verse number 7. The scripture says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven 
with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now, who is this? That's strong, folks. You've got an awful lot of people out there who absolutely refuse to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is a God of justice and judgment. He's also a God of mercy and love. Is he not? He certainly is. But he's a balanced being. He's not just a big kiss up in the heavens. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the king of the universe. And all judgment is given to him. He has every right to, uh, to judge the quick and the dead as is appearing in his kingdom. The Bible says that he shall consume this Antichrist with the spirit of his mouth, the breath of his mouth, and the power of his coming. He's going to take him, Revelation chapter number 13, Revelation chapter number 19, Revelation chapter number 18, and he's going to cast him into a lake of fire and brimstone. The Antichrist, therefore, has a personal enmity with Jesus Christ. The Antichrist is a personal enemy of Jesus Christ. There is a personal animosity between the two of them. Jesus Christ has a personal vendetta on the Antichrist because this is the one who's taking his place on this earth and deceiving men. It's not just a matter of the Son of God taking a sinner and saying unto him, I never knew you, and turning him into a lake of fire and brimstone. He's going to take this wicked creature and consume him with the glory of his appearing and cast him into a lake of fire and brimstone. Notice what it says in Daniel chapter number 7. Verse 11. Watch it carefully. Daniel 7, 11. I beheld, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain. See the slaying? and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. See the distinction made in the, in the nature of this being? He is a beast. He's the Antichrist, but he has a body, so he's put to death. His body is put into the flame to be destroyed. He's going to come, and he's going to burn him up when he appears. But the Antichrist himself, the soul and spirit of this creature, is going to go to the lake of fire. In the book of Revelation, chapter number 18. Revelation, chapter number 18. And uh, let's see. Let's make it chapter number 19. Revelation chapter 19, and look at verse number 11. Let's see. Here it is, verse 20. Revelation 19, verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. Now watch carefully. And compare this with what you read in Daniel 7. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Now look at back in Daniel 7. Hold your place here and look back in Daniel uh, chapter number 7 and verse 11. I beheld even till the beast, this is the Antichrist, was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Now, does the Old Testament teach then, therefore, that there is a difference between the body and the soul? Absolutely. No question about it. And what you just read in the book of Revelation tells you that this beast, the false prophet, doesn't say anything about their body here. It simply says they were cast into a lake burning with fire and brimstone. Then in chapter number 20, verse 11, you find the great white throne and the rest of the sinners judged there and turned into hell fire. That's a terrible thing. I honestly believe if the pulpit started thundering about hell to people today and really began to preach the Bible and preach what the Scripture says about the judgment of God, 
you'd see a difference. You know where the corruption in America is? It's in the pulpit. You want to know where the weak, the weak link in the chain in America is? It's in the pulpit. You want to know where the apostasy in this country is? It's in the pulpit. Most preachers in this country are as reprobate and godless as they can be. They are. They are. There are men in this country, no question, but the thousands who love the Lord and would give their life for him. Good men of God, no question about that. They love God. They love the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of these men I have the greatest respect in the world for, and I know they love the Lord. But the vast majority of the men standing in the pulpit today are nothing in the world more than hired charlatans, godless, reprobates, denying the virgin birth, denying the blood atonement, denying the doctrine of hell, denying the things that make you what you are. That's a shame and a disgrace. But that's what Satan has filled the pulpits with today. And men and women love to hear it so. As they did in the book of Ezekiel, they, Ezekiel chapter number 16, I think it is, they loved it then, they love it now. Now look at what we've done. We've simply taken a simple thing about the Antichrist. We've looked at him in Daniel 7. We've looked at a revelation that was given about 500 years before Christ. We look at this, and we look at something that was written in 90 A.D., and they agree, don't they? They make a distinction. You've got to make the distinction. There is a body, and there is a soul. And the body is thrown to the flames, consumed, burned up. But he's not destroyed. He still exists. For in Revelation chapter number 8, 19, rather, he is taken, this Antichrist is taken, and cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where he'll spend eternity. Man makes the big, man makes his greatest mistake in thinking that you're your body. You're not your body. Your body's just a vessel. When you go out there and get in that automobile after this church service today and drive home, that's a good illustration of what you're doing when you're born. You, go, you entered that body, and when you entered that body, you use that body to transport you and live in for the next 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. One day you'll get out of that body, and you'll go on and leave that body to the elements of the earth. That body's not you. You are inside that body looking out at me. And it's that little dark hole right there. What do they call it? Pupil? The little pupil, the little dark hole. Light enters through that dark hole. It hits what's called rods and cones in the back of your eye. The rods and cones transfer a signal of light into a signal that the brain can distinguish. It's like a computer. Computer works on a very simple principle. Plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. That's all it does. Plus, minus, plus, minus. But it does it very fast. That's all it's doing. And it's just a system and a series of pluses and minuses. Pluses and minuses. They call it, they call it binary code. Simple thing, very simple. Blow your mind at how simple it is, but how profound it is and what it does. It changes that signal that goes into the brain, and there it is. When you're looking at somebody, you're looking at a spirit looking out at you. That spirit is looking through that pupil. That's why eye contact, you ever notice when people in the stores that when they see the eye, they turn away? The eye contact, it's hard to deal with the eye. Uh, because there's power in that eye. That eye is that spirit. That's me looking at you. <laughs> you can look at the back of my head from now on. It won't bother you. But when you look at the eye, not the nose, nor the mouth, but the eye. Look at the eye. And as I've told you before, get within 18 inches of a human being, and you begin to feel their presence. Whether you, whether you can, whether you, anything, get, and the closer you get, the more uncomfortable it gets. Unless that's a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter something of that nature. That's just the way you are. These New Agers say that they, you have an aura around you. They say that they have the ability to look at this aura. Say, what's that? That's this light that's protruding from your body. Well, that's the New Age lie to the truth of Scripture. That's all it is. Because you're not the body. You're a soul and spirit in that body. And the Antichrist is a human being whose body is taken to the elements of the earth and in plain words, it's burned with fire but the soul and spirit of that Antichrist, the human being, leaves and is, in take, and is taken in judgment to the lake of fire and brimstone. And there he'll spend eternity. Well, what a thought, man. You can't dwell on that. The human mind cannot conceive eternal judgment. You think you can. I can't. I can't conceive it. I can't, I can't comprehend the depth of that. It just absolutely blows my mind away. To think that you're going to burn and fry and roast forever? Well, that's just beyond. You can't comprehend that. You can't, you can't comprehend it. You can say that's a horrible thing, and it is horrible. Horrible beyond measure. 
But the, prop, the sad situation is that nobody has to do that. Nobody has to do that. You don't have to burn. Jesus Christ died on the cross, thanks be unto God, and shed his blood so we don't have to burn. Amen. I saw in the paper two days ago, uh, you remember the uh, Gone of the Wind back in the 30s? A uh, little black woman played in that thing. Her name was Butterfly something. Forget her last name. She, and I think I know exactly uh, uh, which one that they're talking about because she was in a lot of old movies. She burned to death at 84 years of age a couple of days ago, 84. And she was living in Augusta, Georgia. And she was heating her home with a little kerosene heater and either kicked the heater over or her, her clothing was caught in some, I forget exactly the detail, but about 70% of her body was burned. And I believe they found her outside. Some of you folks nodding your head, you read the article and you, uh, but she lived long enough to tell them, uh, I think what happened to her. 84, now imagine living 84 years and then burning to death. You see, your life is what, a vapor? You don't know what's going to happen. Imagine living 84 years, folks. Look at all of the tragedies. Look at all the attempts. Look at all the possible scenarios that could have happened to her life in 84 years. And then in her 84th year, she burns to death. It's terrible. That's one of the worst deaths there is. Terrible. And to think you'll burn forever. When I talk like that, I get on my knees before God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I want, you, I want you to know that I know that I want to know that I know that I know that I know that I'm saved by the grace of God. I get on my face before God and say, God, be merciful. I take my place with that thief on the cross. God, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Cry out to him for mercy. There's a bunch today that are arrogant. I'm telling you the truth. They are arrogant when it comes to salvation. It uh, makes me wonder if they've ever known him, if they ever have had any acquaintance with him whatsoever. All right. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ takes the book of Daniel in Matthew chapter number 24 and makes a great statement about it. Would you turn there with me, please? Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter number 24. Okay. Now, the uh, uh, you know the you know the context and the setting. Look at verse number fifteen. He's setting a time for them. Matthew chapter twenty-four and verse fifteen. He said, "When you therefore shall see what." All right, the abomination of desolation, spoken of by who? All right, now. Graf and Wellhausen, which is taught in 90% of the Bible colleges and seminaries in this country. When a young man goes off to Bible college, he goes off to seminary somewhere, and they begin to teach him Old Testament history. They're going to teach him this, this uh, theory, that the book of Daniel was written about 200 B.C. It was written post all of the events that are recorded in it. In other words, it was written after the fact. All of the prophecies in Daniel especially when you find Alexander the Great, he's very clear in there. All of this stuff was written after the fact, after the fact, after it happened, see. Well, if it's written after it happened, then it's not prophecy anymore. This is called the documentary hypothesis. And this is called the school of higher criticism. This is Graf Wellhausen. This is what a young man gets when he goes to Bible college and a seminary, 90% of the time. He's taught that Daniel was not a prophet. He's taught that Daniel was simply, if anything, a young man who lived during the time of Israel's decline, and he created these heroes. And these scribes who lived during this period of time created these heroes. And there really was no Moses, and there wasn't a David, and there wasn't a, uh, certainly wasn't a, a Adam and Eve. These, and Abraham, these are all created heroes. All of this Old Testament history about Israel was all fabricated to set Israel in a good light. This is Graf Wellhausen. This is, this is classic uh, reprobacy. The Lord Jesus Christ, sad to say, believed that Daniel was a prophet, didn't he? He believed it. He believed Daniel was a prophet. Poor fellow. Somebody needed to teach him otherwise, didn't they? Speaking reverently, of course. The Son of God knew what he was talking about. If he called Daniel a prophet, that meant Daniel was a what? Exactly. He was a prophet. And if Daniel was
prophet, and he was, he prophesied about the Antichrist, and he prophesied an event that's called the abomination of desolation. You see, if you buy into Graf Wellhausen and you accept the school of higher criticism, you are literally an imbecile when it comes to understanding the Bible. You really are. You are an imbecile. When you stand up there in your long flowing PhD and THD robes in Scripture, and you've bought Graf Wellhausen and higher criticism and documentary hypothesis and all that junk, you don't know anything about the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist. You understand? You see why mainline Protestant preachers who are standing in the pulpits today don't have a clue about what's happening. The only thing care, they care about is the social impact of the gospel of the church. This is why the National Council of Churches, the World Council of Churches, the great mainline Protestant denominations, they're not, they're not preaching the second coming of Christ. They're preaching peace on earth spread the good news, let's give people clothing and food, and that's all fine. But they reduce the Word of God to that, helping somebody, making them. Well, the reason they do this is because they don't have any belief in the Bible, the Old Testament. There's no way, period, that you can believe Graf Wellhausen and the documentary hypothesis and higher, the school of higher, so-called higher criticism, you, there's no way you can believe that and believe in the second coming of Christ and believe your Bible's reliable. You can't do it. You can't do it. The Lord Jesus Christ was a prophet. Moses said he was. He said, a prophet shall rise like unto me. That's the Son of God. He said Daniel was a prophet. Daniel was a prophet. Daniel talked about the abomination of desolation. He talked about him in three places. And the Lord Jesus Christ quotes him. And he says, when you shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Take note. Well, what is the abomination of desolation? Well, it's a future event, because it's future here in Matthew 24. It's a future event that has, will have a profound effect upon Israel. It's going to have such an effect upon them that it's going to literally drive them out of their land. Nothing has been able to do that yet. This will do it. Nothing. No Gentile army has been able to do that, but this will do it. When one man walks into the temple, there has to be a temple for him to do it. You see how these things begin to fit together. There's got to be a temple. I'm a literalist. I believe the Bible's literal, unless if I have to take it spiritually. In some places it is. Otherwise, I take it for what it says. And I believe there is going to be a temple. The temple's going to be rebuilt. And the Antichrist is going to walk into that temple, and he's going to profess to be God. And when that happens, that's enough of it for the Jewish rabbis, for the Orthodox Jews. That's it. That's, his, that's, that's crossing the line. Out they go. They flee. That's enough. No more peace treaties. Nothing. This finishes it with these people. They flee from Israel, they flee from Jerusalem, and they flee from their land. This is the abomination of desolation. He has his type in the Old Testament. It's happened before. These things are, uh, we'll deal with that tonight. But this business right here is a prophecy. This is a prophecy of what is going to happen. You see what a mess you get in if you don't believe your Bible? You believe anything. If you don't accept the light, all you can accept is darkness. If you don't believe the truth, you're open for the lie. If you reject the word of God, the only thing left for you is the word of man. That's right. There's nothing else. I say as the apostle Peter did, hallelujah to God. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That's where I hang my hope. I put everything I am or ever hope to be in the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he didn't lie to us. He told us the truth. He said, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And as you have seen him go, the angel said in Acts chapter number 1, so shall he come again. I'm looking for him to come. That's right. That's the difference. And he hadn't showed up secretly and he doesn't come in spirit. He doesn't come every time the gospel's preached. He doesn't come every time somebody gets saved so-called say he doesn't come by the preaching of the kingdom he doesn't come by the spreading of the word he will come visibly physically to the spot that he left from and that's what we're looking for that's a bible literalist and that's what i am i'm a bible literalist i believe the bible's real and i believe it's literal and i believe the abomination of desolation is the antichrist when he walks in and it desolates the temple of god any questions about what we've covered so far we're going to talk more about him from Daniel and Zechariah next Sunday. But uh, this is as far as we can go this morning. Any questions? Yes, sir. Okay.
power to do things. We get way That's the life force. Mm -hmm. The soul is you. Soul is your being. Yes, you're right. Revelation 13. When he dies, the first... Exactly. Right. Now somebody would say, well, that's a crazy thing. How can somebody die twice? The Bible says it's appointed to man once to die and in the judgment. How many times did Lazarus die? Exactly. But I mean, even physically here on earth. How about the widow of Nain, son? These people that the Lord raised from the dead in the New Testament, did they die again? Well, certainly they did. They died twice. So is that a contradiction? No, that's a general statement. You're going to die one time. Except those who are alive is appearing. For we shall not all what? But we shall be. See how you've got to get that? What sleep mean? Sleep is the New Testament term for the what of the Christian. Exactly, for the, for the departure. It's called sleep. It's called sleep. All right, well, we've run out of time.